Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. The U.S. government has established a vast system of censorship and by keeping it largely secret, it's been able to exert unconstitutional control over and suppress critical debates regarding its medical, scientific, and climate policies. But Americans are beginning to push back. On March 18, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case Murthy versus Missouri, challenging the government's censorship on social media. At stake is a lower court injunction ruling that the Biden administration, including the White House, the FBI, the Department of Justice, the Surgeon General, the CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, and it seems like most all the other federal agencies, no longer can communicate with or coerce social media companies for, and I quote, the purpose of urging, encouraging, pressuring, or inducing any manner the removal, deletion, suppression, or reduction of content containing protected free speech. Well, this, this is a vital and, and complicated issue, and, and frankly, as a, as a non-lawyer, I'm somewhat at sea in understanding the hows and, and on what basis the Supreme Court will decide this case. So to sort this out for you and for me, all of us non-lawyers out there, is one of the lead plaintiff attorneys in the case, Janine Yunus, who's with the new Civil, Civil Liberties Alliance and who served as a special senior special counsel in the Weaponization Subcommittee. And, and joining us in a minute is, is our latest new arrival in the Yunus family. Uh, and Ameri and uh, Aaron Cariotti, MD, a plaintiff in this case, and a man I think of as an American hero, who's also a, special, a physician specializing in psychiatry, and was fired from the University of California after challenging its COVID ma vaccine mandate in federal court. Aaron's been called by Matt Taibbi the most ambitious theorist of the censorship industrial age. He writes on Substack. So Janine, uh, since, I, since I last saw you, we've had a new arrival. That's and uh, tell us about our new <laughs> arrival. That's right. This is Zane. Uh, he's almost three months old. He was born on January 2nd. Um, and he's, uh, already a free speech warrior. Well, we're going to be, he doesn't believe in any, any the purpose time, of this show, don't worry, Zane, no. we, we're going to be protecting, <laughs> we're going to be protecting your free speech and we're going to take care of your future, young man. Um, uh, and dad's also here. He's, uh, he's with the park service or, uh, uh, uh land trust. Land trust. And yeah. the, he, uh, he's protecting the environment, which is important. The, uh, species and habitat. So, Jane, you've had your moment in the sun. We're now going to go on to other matters. Okay, we're good. Thanks, guys. All right, Kenny, good luck with that. So, Aaron, uh, we've upstaged you with, uh, with Zane. I hope, you, <laughs> I hope you don't mind. A very cute young man. Uh, and we want to talk really about the, the, the drama that happened in the Supreme Court hearings and there's a there's a, a lot of we want to take take from that but before we do that what prompted you to sue the federal government well it started my, with my own experience of being censored online after i filed the lawsuit against the university i was interviewed by a former cbs journalist named allison morrow who had her own podcast and we were discussing just the ethics and the legal issues around vaccine mandates that was that video was censored on YouTube, was taken down, and I was fired shortly thereafter. And then I found out after that that Allison, who at the time was working for the Washington State uh, Department of uh, Natural Resources, was told by her employer that if she didn't take the interview with me down off of the other platforms where she had posted it, that she would be fired. And to her credit, she refused to do that. She refused to allow her own employer to censor her and ended up losing her job. And it was a rather jarring and surreal experience for me, not only to have lost my own job because of 
my stance on vaccine mandates. But the very first person I talked to about that publicly, um, that conversation was censored and that individual lost her job. And so I was trying to wrap my head around what was going on with um, this refusal to have a public conversation about something that was clearly controversial, clearly impacting millions of Americans. And anyone who you know attempted to approach the topic and discuss it, write about it, speak about it publicly, was immediately shut out of the public conversation. And I found that profoundly disturbing. And so when one of the lawyers who uh, at the time was in the state attorney general's office in Missouri, John Sauer, he was the solicitor general of Missouri at that time, uh, called me up because they were thinking of, of filing this case. They had heard Jen Psaki, uh, President Biden's press secretary on television talk about how they were meeting with social media companies. They were pressuring and inducing social media companies to take down constitutionally protected speech. And, and John and the attorney general, Eric Schmidt at the time of Missouri looked at that and said, well, they can't do that. That violates the highest law of the land, the first amendment of the constitution. And so John called me up and said, you've been censored, haven't you? And I, I indicated that I had, and I mentioned the example I just spoke about and a few other examples of being censored and suppressed on Twitter. Uh, he asked if I knew any other doctors and scientists, credible doctors and scientists who had been censored. And so I reached out to my uh, friends and colleagues, Jay Bhattacharya at Stanford and Martin Koldorf, who at the time was at Harvard, two eminent epidemiologists, well known uh, as co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. And I, I knew at the time that they had been censored. And as evidence in our case, and evidence from FOIA requests came out, it became clear that there was a smear campaign orchestrated uh, from the very top of the NIH, the director of the NIH, Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci had an email exchange where they described uh, this Harvard and Stanford uh, epidemiologist and their co-author who was from Oxford as quote, fringe epidemiologists and said that uh, the Great Barrington Declaration needed uh, a swift and devastating takedown. So there was this behind the scenes orchestrated campaign to censor them. So Jay and Martin joined the case as well. And eventually Jill Hines, a health freedom advocate from Louisiana and a journalist named Jim Hoff also joined as private plaintiffs. So this case was filed by two states, Missouri and Louisiana, and those five private plaintiffs that I just mentioned. And uh, what we suspected was going on we found out as we got more documents on discovery, 20,000 pages of communications between the government and social media companies, <coughs> as well as the six depositions that we've done so far, indicated not only was this happening, but it was happening on a much more elaborate scale. It was happening on a much vaster scale than we had initially suspected. So we discovered, for example, that not only were they censoring on COVID-related topics, censoring people who are criti critical of the government's favored COVID policies. But it turns out they were censoring out a whole host of other domestic and foreign policy issues. The government was pressuring social media companies to suppress constitutionally protected speech of people who criticized our monetary policies, people who criticized our foreign policies. And, and, and climate, and yeah. climate. Uh, climate's one of my... Uh... One of my uh, one of my big issues. I'm sorry. Continue, but, but I do I do want you to continue. But I want to get Janine involved. How did you meet with uh, New Civil Liberties Alliance? Uh, because we uh, I've I've had Phil Hamburger on the show before, and also uh, who who argued the case for us? And uh, who's your CEO? Um, Mark Chenoweth. He didn't yeah, argue Chenoweth. it. Oh, he didn't, okay. No, it was anyway. the Solicitor General of Louisiana. The New Civil Liberties is, are exactly the right people to uh, to be working with you on this because they understand the principles as well as anyone. Yeah. So I, I had actually, I kind of got involved in this in a similar way as Aaron. I noticed that when I was tweeting anything about the uh, vaccine, it would either get deboosted or censored. And um, when I saw that Saki and the Surgeon General were making these statements saying that they were getting the tech companies to do this, I was profoundly disturbed. Um, and, you know, when it affects you personally, you kind of see, wow, I really can't get my views out there because of the government. 
Um, and I had a bunch of friends on Twitter who were experiencing the same thing, Mark Cengizi, uh, Daniel Coatsen, and Michael Sanger. So I filed a lawsuit on their behalf that preceded this one, actually. And it was raising basically the same arguments, but it was a bit more constrained. Um, it was just about COVID, and it was just about Twitter. We weren't alleging anything about Facebook because they didn't use Facebook. When uh, our suit was dismissed, the Attorney General of Louisiana and Missouri were working, were planning to file this one, and they knew of my work. Um, and so they obviously knew I was interested in the subject and uh, knowledgeable about it. And so they needed um, attorneys to represent private yeah. plaintiffs. So they asked me to come on board and do that. So that's how we got involved. And so that was that was uh, Aaron and Martin and uh, Jay? And Jill. We represent and Jill. all four of yeah, them. Jill yeah, Jill was there. Jill Himes, yeah. This is ongoing, though. Wasn't Martin Kaldorf just uh, fired from Harvard? Yeah. Well, he just publicly announced that he was fired from Harvard. I think the actual firing occurred some time ago. I, I don't know the full story um, of exactly when, but he, he may have been working with the university to try to reverse that decision. But yes, just a few weeks ago, Martin wrote a piece in, I think it was City Journal, describing what happened to him at Harvard, which is a very similar story uh, to the one that happened to me at the University of California. Yeah, he also didn't want to get the vaccine as he had natural immunity. And uh, that was the issue behind his firing from Harvard, which also, by the way, Martin is one of the most cited vaccine specialists in the world. <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that these, you know, bureaucrats at these universities are writing policies that get him Fired, well, but. Rob Robert Malone, who was in this with us all, has uh, invented the technology, and he didn't think it works. So, it's uh, a lot yeah. of big brains are, are lined up on this on our side. So let's let's fast forward to we had the lower court rule in our favor, and I read some of the language from from his his ruling. And then that came to the Supreme Court. No, actually, there was the Fifth Circuit. We got a fa fairly favorable ruling in the Fifth Circuit. So that was probably like two months after I came on your show last time. Okay. Um, and so that's the Court of Appeals. They trimmed back the injunction a little bit. They, they cut out some of the agencies. They thought there wasn't enough evidence against um, some of them, including NIAID and NIH. So sadly, uh, Collins and Fauci were uh, removed from it. Um, they also changed the standard a little bit. Uh, so they said the companies, sorry, the government can't coerce or significantly encourage, quote unquote, um, the, the, uh, the companies to censor based on viewpoint. Uh, so it kind of means that under the Fifth Circuit standard, the companies and the government can work together or partner, at least there's, there's an argument to be made so the subject of the Supreme Court arguments or a lot of the debate was like, what's the line? Is persuasion okay? Is coercion, is, does it have to be coercion? And it's our opinion, it would be highly problematic if you set the standard at coercion, which unfortunately the court uh, sort of indicated it might do. Because that means that these you know, uh, government entities can work very heavily with the companies to censor American speech um, and, and get away with it because the companies are apparently doing it voluntarily. And the First Amendment prohibits the abridging of speech, the government from abridging speech. Not, it doesn't say coercing. <laughs> um, and interestingly, that's to be contrasted with prohibiting, which is used in the First Amendment context for religion. So it was clear they made a choice about abridging. They didn't say prohibiting, they said abridging. So anything that the government is doing to diminish speech should be considered a First Amendment violation. Unfortunately, based on what we heard, I'm not sure the court will see it that way. So... Aaron, what's uh, didn't didn't Justice Jackson attempt to invent a whole new interpretation of the First Amendment in, during this hearing? Yeah, I, I believe that she did. I don't think even some of the other more liberal justices are going to go quite as far as she did. Indeed, the federal government's own attorney did not go as far as she did. So the, the federal government was attempting at the oral arguments at the Supreme Court to make the case that they never coerced anyone. And Justice Jackson suggested at one point that even coercion might be acceptable if the state had what it considered to be a compelling state interest in suppressing or censoring speech. And the, the government certainly wasn't making that argument. I, I don't know that any of the other justices would be prepared to go quite that far, but it was 
striking and rather shocking to hear that from a Supreme Court justice that at, at one point she remarked that our argument seemed to quote unquote hamstring the government in significant ways, which could be problematic during, <laughs> uh, during certain periods of time. And that made the rounds on social media because of course, the whole purpose of the First Amendment and the entire Bill of Rights is to constrain the government in specific way, specific ways. The First Amendment exists for the citizens of the United States. It doesn't exist primarily for the for the government. Of course, the government has the right to to publicly state its positions and its policies and try try to defend them from the bully pulpit publicly. What it doesn't have the right to do is to go behind the scenes and pressure or coerce third parties to suppress the speech of other Americans. Just to so, so on that point, though, um, I think our position is that even using the bully pulpit to abridge speech is prohibited by the First Amendment. So, you know, the government keeps making these comparisons to, uh, you know, the presidents get up all the time and say we should have lower greenhouse gas emissions and companies should be responsible citizens and help with that. But and I agree that they can say that. But there's no constitutional right to a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions, whereas we do have a constitutional right to free speech. So it's you know explicitly stated in the Constitution that that's where the government, that's where the line is. The government can't take action from the bully pulpit or behind the scenes to abridge our First Amendment rights, our free speech rights. Yeah, I want to I want to riff on this a little bit because this is a really important point. This is an important issue that came up during the oral arguments. I just published a piece today in the Federalist. Uh, trying to explain the reasons why some of the analogies used during the oral arguments don't hold up. So three, it turns out three of the Supreme Court justices formerly were White House attorneys, and they sort of indicated during the oral arguments, Roberts, uh, Kagan, and um, Kavanaugh, they sort of indicated that, you know, we used to call up the New York Times or the Washington Post all the time and encourage them to change a story or maybe hold off on a story or suppress a story. And, you know, Roberts at one point remarked, but I never I never coerced anyone in doing that. Uh, and that elicited some laughter. But they seem to they seem to want to carve out some room for the government to try to persuade social media companies in the way that probably they had attempted to persuade journalists or editors in the past when they worked in the executive branch. The problem, uh, in fact, there are several problems with that analogy. One of the problems with that analogy is when they called up a journalist or they called up an editor, they were talking to the person whose speech they were trying to suppress and they were attempting to persuade that person. And that person could, uh, could say, well, yeah, I see your point. I'm going to hold off on this story until you can get your spies out of Afghanistan. I'll give you a week to do that. Or, yeah, I, I see that I may have gotten this fact wrong, so I'm going to change that. Or they could tell the person on the other end, you know, to go take a hike. You know, I think I got the facts right. I'm going to go ahead and run the story anyway. Well, when they were pressuring social media, they were never in conversation with the person whose speech they were suppressing. You know, my Martin Koldorf, my co-plaintiff, said I would have been happy to get a call from a government official trying to explain to me how I got the science wrong or why I should change my views on this particular scientific policy. But of course, that never happened. So that's one key difference. Another key difference is the government doesn't have the same sort of threats or swords to hang over the heads of the New York Times uh, that they do with the social media companies. Things like removing Section 230 liability protections, which Mark Zuckerberg has called an existential threat to his company, you know, that would destroy their whole business model. Um, threats to break up their mon monopolies, things like this have not, threat, threats like this have not only been made, as we articulate in the record, but they've been made in direct conjunction with the government's uh, uh, pressure on the social media companies to censor free speech. So those things have been paired together, the government's own attempts to suppress speech, and sometimes that's even been done publicly. So it's very important to understand that there's, you know, there's little that the government can do uh, to destroy the business model of the New York Times or to pressure them. And of, of course, if, if they're leaning on a newspaper too hard, 
that's going to be front page news, you know, until the government stops doing doing it. That's going to be the lead headline in the Washington Post above the fold until the government backs off. There's also uh, a difference between, uh, you know, going to one newspaper and saying, don't publish the story, whereas here they're censoring it sort of entire lines of thought. Um, right. You know, anybody who questions whether the vaccine is is a good idea for everybody gets censored on social media. So the lab leak theory, for instance, which we actually have um, very clear evidence was censored because of the government, because there are internal emails from meta executives saying we censored uh, because we were under pressure from the White House. We shouldn't have done it, which is pretty clear uh, <laughs> that the labs that the lab leak theory was censored because of the government and other things. I mean, the government was asking the companies to censor true accounts of vac people posting their personal experiences with vaccine side effects if that would cause vaccine hesitancy. So it's just, it's not like, it's very different from, you know, calling it one story, this might pose a national security threat, can you hold off for a few days versus anybody who says anything negative about the vaccines is but, silenced. But, but these weren't just conversations from the White House directing Facebook to remove that post although they did and there we have we emails yeah. that show direct instruction yeah in fact who was his name ben in the white house uh rob flaherty, rob flaherty, is, flaherty. is the he's, real villain he's a he's a he's a, he's a flamer he, <laughs> he was, and he, andy slavitt were <laughs> okay so yeah. but but this those is, guys knew how to throw tirades but, but and drop there, f bombs but did he but anything <clears> come <throat> up about how pervasive and systematic and organized this is because we have we have CISA and Jen, Jen Easterly talking to us about misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, and the American mind as, as critical cognitive infrastructure. <laughs> and they have meetings with the social media companies every week, every month. They've got pop-up companies that do with, with, with names where you can't quite figure out who, how they're controlled. This is, these are just not conversations. This is systematic. And 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 FBI agents, former FBI agents, are now sitting in the offices of Facebook yeah. and Google and YouTube. I mean, did yeah, that that's right. Yeah, Th thank you for bringing that up because this is an aspect of this case that I think is hard for Americans to wrap their heads around, and it's probably hard for the justices to wrap their heads around. It's much easier to look at uh, the evidence of Rob Flaherty, you know, screaming at a Facebook executive to take down a, a post critical of the president. Um, but that probably accounts for 1% of 1% of the censorship that was happening. Yeah. There's a very elaborated system, which was put in place starting around 2017 and really was fully utilized in 2020 to suppress information around the election. And then following that to suppress information around COVID, Michael Schellenberger calls it the censorship industrial complex. He's one of the Twitter files journalists who's dug into this whole apparatus uh, in some depth. And basically it involves government cutouts. Uh, some, sometimes people call them gongos, government organized NGOs uh, that were set up by the Department of Homeland Security and at the request of this agency called CISA. Uh, these are places like the Stanford Internet Observatory, University of Washington has a censorship outfit that claims to be a university based research program, but is really employs people 24 seven to use sophisticated AI to scrape the internet to see what ideas might threaten to go viral and to, you know, like an engineer at a soundboard mixing a record to turn the volume down on ideas that the government doesn't like and to turn the volume up on ideas that the government does like to literally try to control the flow of information online through um, a massive enterprise of uh, censorship requests that are funneled to the social media companies from CISA, from uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, CISA acting as sort of the central clearinghouse for all these requests, but, but an entire industry set up by the government, funded by government grants, staffed by former government employees that's working 24 seven to do this. Um, it's rather staggering when you sort of peel back the carpet and you see this entire industry that the in, in the phrase censorship industrial complex, the word industry should be taken very literally. This is this is a place uh, that, that they don't call it censorship. They call it, you know, disinformation. This is a place 
that people can make a career. There's, there are training programs at universities to become sort of a full-time, quote-unquote, disinformation expert. That is to say, a, a full-time we'll, uh, we'll... government-employed uh, or government-funded, at least, censor. Yeah, the thing, the one I, the, the, I used to say it was funny, but I don't think it's funny. My favorite one is malinformation, Yeah, mm. where they'll recognize that yeah. something is factual but they don't like the context that, yeah. you, that you put it in, and so they'll. That's right. You know, so they're dealing with malinformation. Well, did they make the argument? Oh no, we didn't need to coerce them because the social media companies already agree with us that this information is 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 hate speech or terrible speech, and 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 we need to shut it down. We didn't even need to direct them because they would have done it on their own. That's, I mean, doesn't that get into large... the issue of? Uh, yeah. Who, who's intending to do what and how, how hard they had to push? That's a large part of their argument. And, um, you know, what I fear the court will find is, is OK. Um, and the CDC was doing something similar. So there's like CISA doing a lot of the, net, the sort of election related stuff. And then the CDC was doing a lot of the COVID related stuff. And their argument is, look, you read these emails. These, co these uh, companies were asking for our help. Uh, and we were just helping them implement their own policies or um, enforce their own policies. We were telling them what is misinformation about the vaccines. And the government has speech rights. The government has a right to, to communicate with these companies. I think, you know, for the reasons I discussed earlier, that's extremely flawed because what they were doing was censoring. And the government just can't be in the business of censoring people. The <clears throat> government could uh, speak with the CDC can certainly speak with the social media companies and uh, say, you know, we think there's a problem with vaccine misinformation. Can you please put our content up to um, what we think is the right thing for Americans to do? Um, or they, the CDC has every right to post on Twitter and say, people are saying things about the vaccine that aren't true. We think everyone should get the vaccine. They have the right to counter speech. But what they cannot do is demand that Americans' speech be taken down. But unfortunately, some of the questions that my members of the court asked, including the swing voters, concern me that they might find that this is okay. And as Aaron said, this is the vast majority of the censorship that's happening. So if the court says that's okay, we're in pretty big trouble. Well, Aaron, you did an interesting analysis in one of your pieces on your Substack site where you, you, you started talking about we've got nine justices, which justices are likely to vote which way yeah. now? Janine can't talk about it because she's in the <laughs> she's in the legal profession and she needs to be. Oh, I can make predictions. I I just have to. Yeah. Um, well, you yeah. can't characterize what you think of them. <laughs> <laughs> if it's negative, well, no. <laughs> uh, let, so, let me just enter the caveat. What, if, that I, what, I think what was that people, like? You're in you're in you're in the, yeah, yeah. you're in this august room and they're up hearing these arguments and you're watching these people react. One of the things that you pointed out was that Justice Thomas, who notoriously said nothing forever post the, the whole COVID thing, he's now starting to speak up. So that's getting interesting. So anyway, I'm interested. Uh, what, what, uh, what's your take on what happened and how they're likely to uh, line up? So, I mean, it was quite something being in the courtroom and observing the oral arguments. My first time doing that. People who watch the court carefully will tell you um, that it's very dicey business trying to make predictions about what the court is going to do based on the tone and tenor of the oral arguments. So a uh, big grain of salt with what I'm about to say, and I could be completely wrong, and I'm not an expert in this, but my impression is that we have three justices that are sympathetic to our arguments and very concerned about the censorship that's been going on. That would be Justice Alito, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Thomas. And in fact, I think we have pretty solid evidence that they're concerned because when the Supreme Court put a temporary stay on the circuit court's injunction, basically saying, until we rule, the injunction is not going to go into effect. Those three justices wrote a dissenting opinion on the stay, saying, no, we think the lower court's ruling should go into effect. We can still hear the case and maybe reverse that later, but they were concerned enough about what was going on, and they thought we had presented enough evidence in favor of the injunction that they didn't want to put a temporary stay on it. And the tenor of their of their questions during oral arguments suggested to me that that's still their position. Uh, Justice Jackson, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Kagan seemed not sympathetic to our arguments. I think Justice Kagan being 
probably the smartest of those three uh, and, and thinking through how she's going to write uh, a, what hopefully is a dissenting opinion about why the government should have been able to do what they did, you know, was trying to punt on the question of standing and trying to, you know, make the case that perhaps the plaintiffs didn't have standing to bring the case. Ex ex in the explain, first place. explain standing, because that's one of the, when I yeah. said the for the non lawyers <clears throat> out there, what is, I think I know what it means, but I'd rather have you tell me. Um, that's uh, the ability of the person who's bringing the case to bring a case. So you can't just go into court and say, I don't like this law. Um, you have to show that you've been injured by the law. Um, you have to show that you personally yeah. have been injured. Didn't they refer to something like the disinformation dozen? Yeah. So the states here, state standing is complicated. I'm not going to get into it. Um, the states know that their standing argument is harder. So that's one reason they wanted individual plaintiffs in the case. And what our argument is, is that these none of, none of our, these people, to our knowledge, were explicitly mentioned, at, at least in the documents we have. No one says, uh, you know, you don't have Rob Flaherty saying take down Aaron Cariotti or uh, Martin Kuldorf. Although, cool, well, Kuldorf was mentioned in one of the NGO cutout um, documents, but that's, that's separate. Uh, our argument is that these people were censored for the types of things that the government was demanding censorship on, and that should be enough. And it should be, because uh, what are the chances, especially before you get discovery, you're going to get evidence that the government asked for you explicitly to be censored. If the government is saying censor vaccine misinformation and then you're censored for vaccine misinformation, that should be enough to bring the case. Um, however, the government's contention is that you should basically need to be mentioned yourself. And uh, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., was mentioned um, by the White House. And they demanded that his account be taken down. He's one of the disinformation dozen. So he's mentioned personally as well as among the disinformation dozen who were then taken down. So um, actually, Alito, RFK tried to intervene <laughs> in the Supreme Court and join our suit. And Alito wrote a dissent basically saying uh, they denied that motion. But Alito wrote a dissent saying we should grant it because RFK has like airtight standing which was an indication he thought other members of the court might try to find we didn't have standing. Our clients don't have standing. Okay, so Aaron, why don't you pick up where yeah. we... Yeah, I, I, I don't think that is going to work. I mean, I, I think the court will find that at least one of us has standing, which is enough. Uh, perhaps Jill Hine, uh, Hines or Jim Hoff, who I think are mentioned in some of the documents by name. But... If they don't, that will open up a vast pathway for continued government censorship because they'll simply say we're going to we're going to do topic based or theme based or idea based censorship, and so long as we don't name names, no one will ever have standing to bring a case challenging the censorship enterprise. And I, I just don't think that is tenable. In fact, that's a pretty terrifying uh, possibility. The three justices that I haven't mentioned, I think, are the three question marks. That would be Barrett, uh, Kavanaugh, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Roberts and Kavanaugh didn't give, I think, a lot of indications which way they were going to go. I think Kavanaugh was, as a former White House attorney, sort of sympathetic to the idea that, you know, maybe calling up and trying to persuade someone of something, so long as you don't force it, is not such a bad thing. Um, but hopefully, you know, he can understand that there's, as I described before, there's key differences in the power dynamics with the social media companies that don't apply to that analogy that he was mentioning. Barrett, uh, I think, was also unclear, but she did ask a very important hypothetical at the end that suggested to me that she understood that even without coercion, Deep entanglements, deep enmeshments. Uh, Janine can explain the idea of joint action, which I is a legal concept that might apply here, where you know if the government becomes too deeply enmeshed with a private entity like a social media company, uh, even if things look cooperative, that could that could be constitutionally problematic. She asked a hypothetical: uh, Could and this was a question to the government's lawyer. Would it be okay or would it be constitutionally problematic in the government's opinion if one of the social media companies gave over an entire area of content moderation to a government agency? They just said, we're going to hand CDC complete control 
over content moderation on COVID related topics, for example. And the, the government attorney was forced to admit, no, that would be problematic. Um, and I think that was an important hypothetical because, well, first of all, it's not entirely hypothetical. I think that's more or less what, what some that? of the companies did <laughs> yeah. during COVID um, in relation to the CDC or the Department of Health and Human Services and the Surgeon General. So, um, so it, you know, admitting that it was problematic sort of indicates that uh, some some of these deep entanglements, you know, may uh, maybe constitutionally problematic. And it indicated to me that that Barrett was maybe starting to understand or wrapping her head around the, the kind of um, problems with not just one individual calling another individual and berating uh, him over the phone or via email, but the whole censorship industrial complex itself was operating in such a way that basically uh, the, the government and the social media companies were becoming indistinguishable. And, um, and that in and, in and of itself, aside from any pressure or coercion, uh, could implicate social media companies as as sort of state actors and thereby subject them to uh, to to con the you know to the constitution. Well, what kind of ruling would we get that would put have a chilling effect on the censorship industrial complex? I mean, you know, all the way to one end of the spectrum, we get a nine zero ruling that this was flat out censorship, and they that's definitely not going to happen. <laughs> So we're going to get some some soft ruling six three five four. We're not sure. If well, we get a, a ruling, majority we get is a, a majority. Ruling, let's say we get we just a favorable need a majority. ruling in this case. Yeah. Wouldn't, didn't they talk about just narrowing it down to the the harm just done to you as individuals and not not a broader class of people affected by government censorship and therefore it wouldn't have any effect on everything else the government is doing. So they could limit the injunction just to the individuals and the, or the individuals in the states yeah. and say only only Aaron Cariotti, Jill Hines, Jim Hoff, Martin Fuldorf, and uh, Jay Bhattacharya can enforce this. However, this is just the preliminary injunction. We still have an entire case that's still in the district court um, that you know we, we can move forward. So with that's discovery. the legal part. So we've got the injunction that was to yeah. so, that was to stop. It was a cease and desist. Yeah, be, basically. And but. Even regardless of what happens here, you're going to go back in and try the whole case. Yeah. I mean, look, there are certain things the court could say that might make that uh, very hard <laughs> to do. Um, I mean, if the court said none of the plaintiffs have standing, um, then, you know, it would be hard to continue with the plaintiffs that we have. Perhaps well, wouldn't you just sw swap in some other plaintiffs? Yeah. And actually, the, the... RFK has been uh, joined with our case below, so that we could probably continue that way if the court just said... Everything that went on here is perfectly fine. The government has every right to say whatever it wants to the tech companies, which is completely inconsistent with the First Amendment and would be a disaster. Um, that might likewise be hard to go forward because the district court still has to use that standard. I, I do think we're going to get something much more mushy. Um, I mean, or hopefully quite clear in our favor. My guess is that there's going to be, you know, a few justices will say, any of this partner partnering is a First Amendment violation. A few will um, only sign on for the coercion, and then there'll be a dissent. Uh, okay. If I were going to make a prediction, I could be very wrong. Well, it, uh, it, it's hard to read that. I, the, the yeah. that I, think, I think, Aaron, you wrote something about, or maybe it was Brownstone that wrote it, that there was a computer model that tried to predict <laughs> what the courts were likely to do, and it was only... Seven percent better than the, than random, the random, random chance. chance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so, it, it, yeah, these predi predictions are all conjectural, but I think Jeanine and I are more or less on the same page in terms of guessing what the court is going to do. But, but I think it's important to remember that first of all, an injunction is very hard to get. You can be denied an injunction because there's a very high sort of legal threshold to get an injunction, evidential threshold. Um, a preliminary the court intervening before yeah. a final ruling. Um, so it's, it's hard to get an injunction. So I think any injunction, even if it's narrowed or softened uh, as compared to the circuit court injunction, is a, a, a big dent in this machinery. If the, go if the government actors have to stop and question, will this 
or will this not violate the injunction? That's going to make their censorship much more difficult. That's right. I think. And th there will be <clears throat> potential criminal penalties attached if they violate the injunction. And so we need a, you know, we need some sort of win here. Um, the censorship enterprise is actually a global phenomenon. And the First Amendment of the United States Constitution is the most robust protection of free speech anywhere in the world. So I think any kind of win at the Supreme Court on the question of the injunction is going to be a big step forward. And just the fact that this case is shining light on what's happening and it's, you know, it's been front page news for the last week or so since the oral arguments is also you know a very positive development because Americans are starting to wake up and realize what the government's been doing and you know lots of them are t deeply unhappy about this well the other i know the other just well justice jackson basically is saying look we this constitution i'm i'm in these black robes and i'm in this room but this constitution's really getting in the way of what we ought to be doing but the other eight justices, it sounds like, at least are trying to work within the language of the Constitution and find a constitutional ruling as opposed to, I mean, we're dealing with a world of lawfare now. And there's a lot of, I mean, if you look at what's happening with Trump, it's hard to find, you know, any basis for some of this. I mean, didn't in New York they created a new statute just to go after Donald Trump specifically in this fraud case? And there's not we're, we're living in a more and more lawless time do you, how optimistic are you that if we do get some sort of favorable ruling here that that's really going to stop uh to stop the lawless uh, um, agenda that these people have well that's a good question but the <clears> thing <throat> is that once you have a ruling the um repercussions for the individuals who are perpetuating this regime will be much more significant so once you have a clear ruling you can sue um, people in their okay. uh, their personal capacities. So when before there's, well, the law is a little bit fuzzy. I mean, I would say it's not that the First Amendment's clear, but we can admit there's no Supreme Court ruling on whether the, uh, you know, on this specific issue of the tech companies and government working together or being coerced to censor. Um, while there's no clear ruling, um, you tend to sue people in their official capacity, and that means they don't have to pay personally for what they've done. Once there's a clear ruling saying this is not lawful, you can sue people in their individual capacity, which means there are personal repercussions for them, and you can sue for damages, which mean, means you can get money. So, so the it, incentives so, change so, so to this comply. Can really, this can really matter. The, yeah, it could really matter. And um, I will also add, based, because I sounded a little bit pessimistic earlier, um, we were up on a win, and I think that the majority of the court thought that the Fifth Circuit had gone too far. But, and so that was part of why the tenor of the argument seemed so negative for us. But I don't think th that they thought everything the government did was just fine, or I certainly don't think the majority of them thought that. Um, it was just a little bit, it was very different from the Fifth Circuit's um, tone, which was sort of shock that the government would even do anything remotely like this. Martin, you're, you want to follow up, or Aaron, you want to follow up with... Uh... I mean, yeah, I, I, let me I, let me ask. I wonder if there's cultural differences, you know, between a district court judge in Louisiana, a Fifth Circuit, three judge panel who exist outside the swamp of Washington D.C., uh, looking at what actually goes on behind the scenes with some of these federal agencies and being appalled by it, versus you know people who live and work and grow up in that atmosphere of the, of the world of Washington, D.C. And I think Supreme Court justices are not immune from this, this idea that, you know, we're the ones in power and, um, you know, we sort of know how things need to be. And one of the challenges with the American system is that the Constitution constrains the government, but the enforcement of the Constitution, the application of the Constitution to specific cases in the courts uh, relies on basically self-restraint by the government. So <laughs> we're, we're asking the government to restrain the government's own power. And um, I think there's been a broad consensus in the United States of the importance of that. And the will of the people has been strongly behind that for much of American history. But uh, perhaps over the last 20 years or so, 
um, it's becoming increasingly clear that many Americans, unfortunately, no longer believe in the Constitution. Many young people today yeah. don't understand the reasons and the importance for uh, the First Amendment protections of free speech and, and the other freedoms guaranteed. It was written by white men, so it must be bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those, those terrible white men. <laughs> well, that is that is a big issue. And did you feel that do you feel at all that this is one of those careful cases for Justice Roberts that, uh, you know, he's always preserving the trying to, and he should to try to preserve the standing of the court. And could this be so politically charged that people start talking about court packing? Um, I, I don't I don't know that things are going to go that far because I mean one of the one of the one of the things that the censorship enterprise doesn't want is sunlight right all of this was operating in secret prior to our case and prior to the Twitter files and the last thing that this whole censorship industrial complex wanted was for people to find out what they were doing so some sort of big political push uh, at the courts to try to get the right kind of ruling in this case, I think is only going to increase public attention on the case. And I, I think the people who are engaged in this enterprise, that's, that's the last thing that they want. They've only sort of come out of the shadows in the last week or two because they've been forced to do so by uh, virtue of the fact that this case has been in the news and, and the progression, you know, the progression moves from first they they ignore you, you know, nothing to see here. And then they dismiss you. Oh, government censorship is a conspiracy theory. Um, and then when that is no longer tenable, they say <laughs> they pivot to, well, yeah, this is happening. But of course, it's a, it's a good thing that it's happening. It's, it's necessary that it's happening, which is sort of the argument that you saw at the Supreme Court. Um, but they, they don't really want to make that pivot to admit that it's actually going on because that will bring a lot of critical scrutiny on the behavior. So I think they're going to continue to try to downplay this. They're going to continue to try as best they can, whenever they can, to keep it out of the public eye because this only really works when people aren't aware that it's happening, when a sufficient number of people are aware that it's happening, and then they realize that they've been actually victimized by it. They've been subjected to censorship. It's they've also been one of their strategies has just been to paint it as a right wing conspiracy theory, yeah. as you alluded to. And this is all Trumpian people. Matt Taibbi actually wrote a great piece on that. I mean, the people who like me and you, well, Matt, you <laughs> who know, know the about three of you are particularly Trumpian. That's, no, yeah, that's... and uh, also like we <laughs> we based our uh, impressions off reviewing. Thousands and th I mean, I've probably reviewed 20,000 pages of documents that yeah. reach these conclusions. But, you know, the average person uh, doesn't even read an article about it. So it's easy to say, oh, these people are just conspiracy theorists. Um, yeah. Well, you, you know, it does it does seem like in this they took they 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 got out in front of the censorship thing, taking advantage of the technology, the social media companies. But Aaron, as you point out, once we begin shining a light on this. And this technology, this AI, or the, not AI, but the, uh, you know, we can use that ourselves. Yeah. And we're, we, we, now that we know who they are and what they're doing, and we can name names, yeah. individuals, we can, we can make it extremely uncomfortable for them. Yeah. Like, I don't think Jen Easterly wants to be featured as, as a profile in anything. She thought she went into some cushy government job <laughs> and was going to operate in obscurity. I was Kate Starbird seems to like to be on the front pages of things. Who's, who's that? Kate Starbird? She's she was one of the censors at the University of Washington. She's uh, sort of one of the big ones who has been involved in this. In fact, she's been on like the front pages of five or six different pa papers. And Matt Taibbi wrote a piece last night that said, you know, they keep putting out these pieces with photos of disinformation researchers looking sad. <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's not a great face for the movement. I mean, you listen to her and you look at her and you, you start thinking, who made who made this person the arbiter of what is true and what is false? Um, what authority does she have to tell uh, doctors and scientists from Harvard, Stanford and the University of California that they're mistaken on some scientific question? 
um, because she calls herself a disinformation <laughs> researcher, whatever, whatever that is. So, so my line of action with a lot of these issues <clears throat> is the more we can make it personal and the more we can pro put a profile face videos of these people and who they actually are, I think that destroys their credibility. I mean, a lot of these people operate under the, under the facade of a federal agency and oh my gosh, you know, I, I ran a public company, had to deal with the Security and Exchange Commission, and you get a letter or something like that, and you realize it's just this one junior lawyer who, who yeah. wants to make a career move that is trying to put something out there. And if you can identify, isolate, and do a little solo Linsky with them and, and put them out in public, I think it works for us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm for it. <laughs> Well, what else should we, we're, this has been fabulous. Any final words, uh, Aaron? Yeah, I, I think it's important for listeners to understand that, you know, they, some listeners may be thinking, well, I haven't necessarily been personally impacted by this issue because I'm not on social media or maybe I have an account on Facebook or, or on X, but I don't post anything. I just go on to see what other people are saying. So I probably haven't personally been censored by the government. But the Supreme Court has made it clear in previous uh, cases that the First Amendment right of free speech exists not just for the speaker, but also for the listener, that your rights are, are harmed and, uh, and violated when censorship happens, because in a functioning republic, in a functioning democratic system, the public needs access to information in order to make informed decisions about voting, about public policy about the things they're going to support, about, you know, health-related behaviors. And <clears throat> what we got during COVID, just to use that as one example, is what Jay Bhattacharya calls the illusion of scientific consensus, that there was actually deep disagreement and debate on the government's preferred pandemic policies, from lockdowns to vaccine mandates to the use of masks. But the public wasn't aware of that because one side of that debate was artificially suppressed. And so censorship affects all of us. Um, people died during COVID because of censorship. People died during COVID. People were harmed during COVID because policies that ended up doing more harm than good, school closures, lockdowns, uh, were put in place and they remained in place far longer than they should have because the critics of those policies were silenced. So this has real world consequences. Most of what they targeted was true speech. And that's precisely why they targeted. It was threatening to their power. Um, so, you know, they weren't primarily targeting people who's, you know, were claiming on Twitter that aliens have implanted a chip in my brain and are controlling me from outer space. I mean, people like that may have been censored by the government, but the government was primarily concerned about voices like like the plaintiffs who were credible, uh, persuasive, intelligent people who had something to say, who had something to contribute. And because we were critical of the government's preferred policies, we were we were a threat. So we don't have to establish for purposes of our legal case that the information that was censored was true. All we have to do is establish that it was legal speech, uh, that it was constitutionally protected speech, which is easy to do because the categories of illegal speech that are not constitutionally protected are very, very narrowly defined. Things like direct incitement to physical violence or child pornography, those are not forms of protected speech. But obviously that's not what the government was going after. They were going after uh, people who were trying to make a case that, um, that we should be sort of approaching things differently on, you know, this or that foreign or domestic policy. So this is an issue that affects all of us, it has real world consequences when the government does this. And that built in corrective mechanism of public discussion and debate uh, can't function in a system uh, that's characterized by government censorship. Scientific advancements can't be made if uh, censorship infects science and medicine. Scientific progress happens precisely because people challenge a particular consensus. Uh, they put out a new hypothesis. They, they test existing theories uh, to see if they hold up under 
scrutiny. So science and censorship are totally incompatible. Um, and so this harmed, this harmed science, this harmed medicine, uh, this harmed Americans' ability to make informed decisions about their health. And, um, you know, it's, censorship is the seedbed of totalitarian systems. It's, it's where all, all those systems always begin. So we're going to stop it. <laughs> I know, but that's very well said. I, I was just thinking about copying and pasting that for, uh, for uh, promoting the show. But there's something else we need to promote, and it's what Janine's doing uh, with the new Civil Liberties Alliance, which is an incredible organization. And you all exist to do what? Um, to fight the administrative state, mainly. Uh, so to ensure that uh, agencies aren't acting outside of their authority, um, to try to constrain agency power and to protect Americans' rights. So uh, I actually have another case I'm going to California for, which I also represent, Aaron, <laughs> where we're arguing um, California had enacted a statute uh, prohibiting doctors from giving patients advice about COVID that departs from the scientific consensus. And we actually won and the state repealed the statute, but now they want to throw the case out. We want a preliminary injunction. We want to continue to litigate the case so that the state, you know, we can establish that the state can't do it again. They so, don't for, want so for that. people who have these issues who feel like they're being abused by the administrative state, we should get in touch with you. Yes. You represent people, some people pro bono. We represent everyone pro bono. Everybody's Nobody pro pays. bono. Yeah. So, it's, so if yeah. you've got a case, and particularly if it's a constitutionally significant case, yes. this is something that you're looking for and, and want to push. I, I know yeah. I'm a supporter of what you all are yeah. doing. So, uh, Free speech is a big one, and uh, agencies abusing their power. Is okay. Another. Federal agents. Well, that happens. Yeah. You, you, it's a target-rich environment. Yeah. Right? That's, <laughs> you, you, we, we don't have a shortage. We're, we have no, to turn a lot of people right. away, sadly. Well, that, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, this has been fantastic. We can't, we're just tip of the iceberg on so many of these things, but, uh, you know, this is a good start. I think it understand, we understand what's at stake with this case, so thank you. Um, Aaron thank writes you. on Substack, uh, highly recommend you take it in, uh, and I'd also highly recommend you subscribe. I also recommend you subscribe to us on uh, on Substack and all the other podcast platforms that uh, you, you listen to podcasts or watch them. We're on YouTube and rumble and i i think we'll get past the youtube censors on this although i'm not sure <laughs> and you, you can find janine Yunus at uh, new civil civil liberties alliance and hope you'll all be both be coming back as these things evolve because we're in a we're in a big fight and we gotta win yep <laughs> anyway so all thanks, thanks for joining Bill. and uh, thanks, thanks, thanks aaron for coming in from california and we will uh, we'll see you next time so 